my name is Brock Howell. I'm the executive director of uh, the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition, or SnowTrack, and this is our monthly speaker series, um, which is on the future of transit funding in our capitals, DC and Olympia. And I, uh, we are honored to have Chris Wall here from Transportation for America and Alex Hudson from Transportation Choices Coalition. Um, before we get going, I would love to just do a quick round of introductions. Um, and so I'm gonna do something a little crazy considering I'm outside and myself probably shouldn't be unmuted for the entirety of this presentation uh, because it's a little loud in my space. But if I could ask everybody to unmute themselves, I'm gonna say your name. And then if you could say who uh, you're with and then if you're just a, you know, a community activist, go ahead and mention you're a community activist just so we can get a sense of who's all here, uh, which will also help our presenters today. So I'm gonna go down the list as uh, I recorded them as we go through. And um, so go ahead and everybody unmute yourselves. And then well, once you say your organizational name, go ahead and put yourself back on mute. So I'm gonna start with Alice Dersham. I'm with Snohomish County Public Works. Fantastic. Autumn Sharp. I'm with Transportation Choices Coalition. Okay. Quentin Harrington. I'm with Snohomish County PUD. Victor Harris. Victor Harris, Snow Track Community Advocate. Great. Larry Brewer. With Snohomish County Public Works. Christina Curtis. City of Everett Public Works. Janice Fanning. Snohomish County Public Works. Uh, Pat Kinney. Red Cross. Sabina Araya. Community Transit Planning Department. Um, we have a phone number. Um, so if you weren't calling in via your, uh, your computer, um, it, I think it's actually probably the city of Everett number 425-348-7100. And we might have to come back to you. Uh, Deborah Evison Bell. I'm with Snohomish County Council. Right. Christine Reed. Christine Reed, IBEW 77 political director. Wonderful. Martin Jackson. Uh, Snohomish County Public Works. Sawa Rafael. Uh, Hopeland Mobility Management. Right. Keith Weir. IBEW Local 46, political director. Wonderful. Um, Claire Martini. Leafline Trails Coalition. Casey Stevens. Casey Stevens, Illiguamish Tribe, Tribal Planner. Daniel Hoyt. Uh, Washdot Regional Transit Coordination. John Morrison Winters. Hi, yeah, this is John Morrison Winters with Aging and Disability Services, King County. Um, Emily Wicks. Hi, this is Emily Wicks, State Representative for the 38th Legislative District. And finally, Alex Hatcher. Hello, I just got the audio. Were you asking me to introduce myself? Uh, just the organization you're with. Oh, thank you so much. Hello, Alex Hatcher, Center for Independence, North Sound Counties. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. All right. Well, um, again, thank you all for joining us today. I think we have a great discussion. Um, there's plenty of happening on transportation funding in DC and Olympia, as you know. Um, and so I am uh, honored to have both Chris and Alex here. Um, I first met Chris Rawl when I was working in Oregon back in, I think, 20, in 2009, uh, back when he just started with Transportation for America. And I was working on a campaign called Transportation for Oregon's Future, trying to pass the state transportation package. And it's been a great pleasure uh, working with Chris ever since then through numerous different roles. But Chris has always been a stalwart uh, in his role with Transportation for America, living in Portland, uh, and being the National Outreach Director. Um, and he's gonna be able to provide us a great overview of what's happening in DC. 
Um, Alex Hudson is executive director of Transportation Choices Coalition. Transportation Choices Coalition is a uh, nonprofit advocacy group uh, advocating for transit, biking, walking, um, just making our communities a better place. And they've been the leading voice on many <laughs> transportation measures uh, and transit funding measures um, since the starting uh, in the mid 90s. And it's great to have Alex and she's been a, a wonderful voice uh, for transit uh, since joining TCC a couple of years ago. Um, with that, uh, I think we're just gonna go ahead and get started and I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. Neither Chris nor Alex has a PowerPoint. So we're just gonna have this as a bit of an informal uh, conversation and presentation from them. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I would ask um, if everybody would uh, just turn off your videos if you have them on, except for Chris, so we can watch Chris uh, do his presentation. And I'm gonna go on mute. Thank you, Brock. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. And it's, it's really a pleasure to talk with you all. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background of um, where we're coming from with Transportation for America, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit uh, organization that's working to advance um, transportation in a way that allows people, no matter who they are, to be able to get to the things they need to get to, um, whether they have a car or not. Um, and you'll see in a lot of our um, of our work, there's really three principles that are infused through it. Um, the idea of uh, prioritizing maintenance, um, designing for safety over speed, and um, connecting people to jobs and services. So those three things are really, um, uh, uh, you'll see them just sort of infused with the way that I talk about federal policy. We work um, through advocacy, technical assistance, and thought leadership's kind of our approach to how we improve things. And then we are a part of Smart Growth America, which works more broadly on uh, creating communities that where everyone can, can live and thrive. Um, and so we just, transportation just doesn't exist in a vacuum for us. It connects to all these other ways that we're trying to make communities better. Um, and um, uh, Brock mentioned my roots roots in the Pacific Northwest. I'm, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. I started off at, at Transportation for America a little over 11 years ago as the Oregon field organizer. My turf expanded to both Oregon and Washington um, for a period of a number of years. So I'm pretty familiar with a, at least a, a number of the issues in the state of Washington um, and have been up to your part of the world a number of times. Um, so I'm hoping that I can kind of uh, help to interpret some of the information at the federal level and how it will impact you all. Um, my background here is is from uh, Southern Washington, from, from the mountains in Southern Washington, which I enjoy visiting. So, um, so what I wanna cover today is um, a few things that are going on at the federal level. There's there's reauthorization, and I'll talk about what that is, the, 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 the long-term transportation bill. There is a bipartisan infrastructure proposal that's been in the news uh, pretty heavily in the last few days. Um, and then there's this concept of reconciliation or, or an infrastructure package, kind of what are the different vehicles for how things could move uh, through Congress. Um, so let's just start with reauthorization because that is a thing that is happening that has to get done by September 30th. Um, this is basically the long-term transportation bill. Um, right now, we've been operating under the FAST Act. It was supposed to expire in September 30th of 2020. Uh, Congress extended it for a full year. So now it's expiring at the end of September of this year. Um, and so we've been operating under a law for about six years now uh, called the FAST Act. And Congress needs to develop a new law that will generally run for about five years. What it really does, uh, the transportation, the surface transportation reauthorization, is it sets up buckets of, of funding that um, buckets that funding can be put into. So it's really kind of like setting the tone for then each year how much funding is dedicated to various programs and what we invest in transportation. It is um, very important because it runs for five years. It, it um, directs, generally directs and provides some certainty for where federal funding is going to go. Um, and it tends to attract local and state funding because, because entities want to go after that federal funding and they bring matching funding to do that. Um, so it's very influential and it can have an impact on your communities for decades. It's important <laughs> and it's happening right now. Um, and there's 
you know, kind of a process for how it's developed. In the Senate, there are four committees that develop the transportation bill. And in the House, there are two committees. Um, and some of those committees have done their work so far and some have not. So I'll get into that in a minute here. Um, so yeah, I think that covers what the, what the reauthorization is. And let's, let's talk about like what's, what's been done so far. Um, so right now, um, the Senate side um, has four committees that need to move a transportation bill. The lead committee is the Environment and Public Works Committee, and they develop the highway portion of the bill. Um, and they have actually passed their, their bill out of committee at this point. Um, and I'll uh, paste in the chat. I've got um, um, kind of links to some blog posts that can kind of help you if you want to do some further reading on some of these things. So this is a post about the Senate highway title. Um, and I uh, just want to rearrange one more thing so I can see things a little better here. Great. Um, so this bill, um, the way we describe it is when bipartisanship is the goal, the broken status quo is the result. This is, this is a bipartisan bill that passed unanimously out of committee and it's, it's not great. It's, it's, uh, it's basically largely a status quo bill um, running the federal programs the way they've been run in the past, which tends to result in a lot of, um, of highway expansion, falling behind on, on maintenance of highways, anemic investment in, in transit um, and just not seeing real improvements in our communities in terms of how we're doing transportation. Um, what these bills tend to do is, is have a silo of funding, a small silo of funding that tries to fix all the damage that the overall program is doing. And so in this case, I'll go through what some of those things are. Um, um, but that's the kind of overall picture of it. And so some of the things that are in this bill, and you'll see a lot of this in the blog post that I just posted the link to, um, it does support um, a shift to measuring multimodal access. The way that we've been doing transportation for decades is, is measuring success by looking at how we're addressing congestion. And the problem with that is what you're in effect doing is measuring how fast cars are moving along segments of roadway. And that doesn't concern us with whether anyone actually arrives in any destination, and it doesn't concern us with if people are using other modes besides driving. Um, and it tends to result in designing roads in such a way that you, you know, you're kind of moving people quickly, but not necessarily trying to move destinations more quickly to more close together, or trying to create environments where businesses can really thrive so that people can be close to the things that they need. Um, or where, you know, where housing is put in places where it's close to the jobs and the other services. So this bill does actually support creating a, a multimodal access um, performance measure, but it uh, doesn't require um, its use. It creates a pilot program for some states and MPOs to start using it and to kind of create a national baseline, but um, doesn't go beyond that. So it makes a little bit of progress in this area, but not as much as we would like. Um, it does have a reconnecting communities program, which is something that's really come up um, in a lot of um, discussions over the past year. We have a, a history um, in our national highway program of, of ramming high, urban highway construction through the, the most disadvantaged communities, um, dividing those communities, uh, you, know, you know, applying eminent domain to, to, to you know, destroy those communities. Um, and so this program has uh, a source of funding to try to start to reconnect and, and fix some of the damage that's been done um, in those places. But it's a pretty anemic amount of funding. It's just 100 million per year, which probably would just result in doing a lot of planning and not actually doing projects to either remove freeways or improve connections across them. And it doesn't have um, anti-displacement -dip provisions, provisions that if you invest in a community and start to improve it, to try to make sure that the people who are living there benefit rather than getting forced out by increased rents. Um, there is a bridge program, it's a good thing. Um, there is a lack of accountability for repairing highways. Um, so the, the big highway program doesn't really require state DOTs to uh, make progress on um, improving their state of repair. They can continue to spend a large portion of their highway funding on, on highway expansion, even if they are falling way behind on their maintenance backlogs. It has a carbon reduction program, um, which I think a lot of folks were excited about because of the title of it. 
Um, it does all, a lot of the things you would expect a carbon reduction program to do. It invests in biking and walking, um, electric uh, vehicle, charging infrastructure. Um, and the problem with it is that it's just one kind of silo of the program. And while we're expanding highways over on this side, we can kind of do a certain amount to try to tamp that um, that increase in emissions down with with investments in these other things, but it ends up being a Band-Aid on, on a gaping wound that doesn't cover it up. So um, there's kind of a, some good ideas there, but they're not enough to kind of overcome the status quo elements of the bill. It has an EV charging program, um, but unfortunately it allows propane and national uh, natural gas charging in that program as well. Um, so not really getting us straight to where we need to be. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, I see a question in the chat. I did post a link to the, to a blog post that's about this bill. So if you're not seeing that, maybe someone else can repost, re, repaste it. Um, the, uh, it, it does, um, it does improve somewhat the infra program. It's a major freight program. It increases the amount of funding within that program that can be used for multimodal freight projects rather than just pure highway projects from 10% to 30%. I think it could do a lot more than that. Um, it, it allows for states to increase the, um, um, to, it allows for states to increase the um, number of deaths that they're shooting for each year um, in terms of pedestrian deaths um, on their safety targets. Um, we think that states should be required to be shooting for reducing those deaths. Um, and then it has another multimodal freight program, but then it only allows 50% of the funding within that multimodal freight program to be used for, um, to be used for multi, truly multimodal projects. So, you know, just kind of a bill that we're not really happy with, um, has a lot of status quo, a few good ideas in it, um, but, but overall pretty disappointing. Um, just this past week, the, uh, I think it's just last week, the Commerce Committee also moved their portion of the Senate bill. So there's, there's four committees in the Senate. There's the Environment and Public Works Committee that I mentioned, they, they just developed that highway title. They're kind of the lead committee. The Commerce Committee does rail and safety. The Banking Committee, which I'll get to in a bit, does transit. And then the Finance Committee figures out how to fund the bill. Um, so the Commerce Committee has now passed their um, bill. So it's prim primarily about rail and also has a safety title within it. Um, and then I will um, paste the, we have a blog post about this particular bill as well. And the gist of this is it's actually much better than the highway title. Um, we have a, one, our, the Senator uh, of Mississippi, uh, Senator Wicker is, is a good friend of ours and is very enthusiastic about rail. And so uh, in this case, bipartisanship won the day in terms of, uh, of having a robust investment in, in, uh, trans, in um, passenger rail and thinking about how we can really improve it around this country. So there's a, a $5 billion program for Chrissy. That's a program that helped to bring uh, Gulf Coast rail very close back to restoration. Um, there's, there's a lot of funding for other loans to help improve um, passenger rail. It requires Amtrak to preserve long distance routes as long as they have the funding to do it. And um, it provides some funding to create regional rail commissions. And this is a really important thing. The Gulf Coast rail is very close to being restored. Um, it was eliminated um, after Hurricane Katrina. And it was the, the work of the Southern Rail Commission, a regional rail commission across several states that has been really key to uh, bringing that, that rail service back and working together and winning funding from Congress and getting the states to work together. Um, and so this bill provides regional rail commission funding for other regions to do that. And you know, right here in our region, of course, there's the, the Cascades Corridor. And so creating a rail commission for Oregon and Washington and figuring out a way to include British Columbia in that would go a long way to um, uh, improving rail service in our, in our neck of the woods. So that's a, that's a nice piece of that. And then in, in safety, they, um, made some improvements too. Right now, data collection on safety is really um, substandard. Um, there is 
um, just very very lack of lack of detail on how they collect collect safety data. If there's was a mobility device involved or a scooter, there's no information on that that's collected when there are crashes. So this bill improves the the way that we collect the data, um, and it also has two hundred million dollars for Vision Zero grants uh, for communities that are developing their Vision Zero plans. So that's what's happened so far in the Senate. Um, the Banking Committee, we we believe, is writing a bill right now. They've been very tight-lipped about what's in it or what they're doing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we just don't know what's going on there other than uh, Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania is um, not, a, not a transit fan. And so the how they would come out with a bipartisan bill from the banking committee isn't really that clear to us and it could be that they're going to write something and we're not going to really see it and it'll just sort of be inserted into the bill into the overall transportation bill when it goes to the floor or at least that's one possible scenario that seems kind of likely at this stage so that's the senate side that's where they are and we think that they will probably get to the floor um, and vote on their bill sometime in july um, now the house side is uh started a little bit behind the senate um this year, but they are um, moving quickly. And so this is a, a post we have about the uh, one of the posts we have about the House bill. This bill um, is kind of a we call it invest 2.0. The House passed um, um, a really solid bill in the summer of of 2020 um, that we were pretty excited about. We really felt like it hit all three principles that we were concerned about. And this does even better. So um, we're pretty excited about this bill. It um, makes fundamental changes to the program rather than, than sort of having this, the status quo program and then adding little programs to fix it. So, you know, some of the fundamental things it does really is emphasizing repair in the highway program. That's the biggest chunk of funding. If we can get state DOTs to be required to focus on repair, there's going to be less highway expansion and highways that are dividing communities and make it harder to, harder to serve them with transit and um, incentivizing sprawl. So um, that's a really key provision. And it also helps us to get on top of our, our state of repair backlog, which we need to do. Um, and so there's climate and equity kind of um, concerns infused throughout the bill rather than in these separate programs. Um, it has stronger language on this idea of, of multimodal access, measuring the number of um, jobs and essential destinations that you can get to in a reasonable amount of time. I talked about how the Senate bill has kind of a pilot program and would create a performance measure. This establishes a performance measure and then requires states to start using it. Um, and it has some grant programs that kind of are oriented towards that idea of how do you improve access to for, for people, whether it's by biking, walking, transit, et cetera. So it has sort of this multimodal grant program that can help folks to improve access in their communities. Um, it has a um, reconnecting communities program similar to the Senate's, but much more funded in a much, much more robust way. Um, and with some, uh, I don't, we think the language can be strengthened, but it has some anti-displacement language. So in terms of addressing these highways that have been punched through um, communities that have um, been historically underserved, or um, quite frankly, are the communities of color um, frequently, um, this, this helps to start to address that. So that's funded at $3 billion, um, which actually could get uh, some projects done. Um, in terms of rail investment, it, it does a lot of what the Senate does. But in addition, it has this program called the Prime Program that invests pretty heavily in passenger rail. And we could see a lot of really significant improvements in um, incremental high-speed rail. Um, and it also has the language around creating those regional commissions um, that can create these interstate compacts and improve our um, regional passenger rail service. And it has a really significant increase in, in funding for transit. It goes from 13 billion per year to 21 billion per year. So um, that's, that's a great increase. And there's even some language in there around, um, around allowing um, that funding to be used for operations. So that's one of the big things we're really pushing for is how can we create more of a shift um, in the federal program has always been an emphasis on capital investment. Um, and sometimes that's the most useful thing for a transit agency. They wanna invest in um, buying more buses or doing bus rapid transit improvements. But for a lot of agencies, if they could just 
run more buses on the street, they would have more service and that would be like the biggest, quickest improvement for people. So that's something that we're, that's in the bill and we're working to actually get more of that into the bill um, with a, a bill from Representative Johnson from Georgia, who's been working on that issue. Um, so that's a house bill, it's looking really good and that's gonna go to the floor next week. So um, we think it's likely to pass and it's kind of a question for us of, of how much uh, more operating funding we'll get into it. And the other thing that's obviously been, obviously has been kind of um, timely of late is this discussion of a um, bipartisan infrastructure pro proposal. There's 21 senators, it was 20 and then it became 21 senators um, who are supporting a proposal for investing in infrastructure. And um, it is um, just really hard to sort of um, evaluate how good or, or bad this proposal is. Um, it's, you know, it's basically like these line items. I just pasted a link in of, the, of one of the versions of this. I don't know if this is the absolute most recent version. Um, that you know these line items and then how much funding is gonna be spent on that thing. But within that line item, we don't really know what they're proposing to do. Um, and so um, in terms of the outcomes we think this would produce, it's just hard to predict and the proof is gonna be in the pudding in terms of how, a, um, how this is actually implemented. What does it look like in actual legislation? So this is kind of just a very strange discussion to talk about how much we're gonna spend on stuff without talking about what we're actually trying to do with the funding. We're gonna to continue to sort of analyze this and try to understand as more information comes out about it, what it means. Um, on its face, it could mean a, a great increase in transit funding, but that depends on interpreting whether these line items are part of the reauthorization or if they are in addition to it. Um, so it's just been very difficult to interpret and um, something we just continue to watch with a somewhat skeptical eye, but um, we'll see what happens. Um, and then the idea um, behind this, this bipartisan proposal is that could be passed through regular order in the Senate. There's two ways, two ways to pass bills in the Senate. There's regular order where um, you can put anything in the bill you want. And then there's this concept of reconciliation that I'm sure you've all heard about where um, you can't put policy in, you can just put amounts of funding in. And there's a lot of discussion about what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Um, but basically if you have policy in place and you have programs in place, you can do a reconciliation bill that can be passed just with 51 votes in the Senate and put that money into existing programs. You can't create new programs. So it's really important that we get good policy in place um, before any kind of reconciliation bill is passed or we're gonna see um, just money put into programs that are, you know, that may be ineffective. Um, so that's that's an overall picture of um, what we're seeing on the Hill right now. Um, I'm happy to either take questions now or maybe we'll let Alex go first and then we can take questions at the end. Yeah, let's take a, a moment, maybe five minutes for questions and then we'll kick it over to Alex. Um, so I don't, let's see here, I guess somebody is in the chat I need to admit in, but um, is there, do folks have questions that they would like to, to bring up? And feel free to type them in the chat and then I could restate them or just take your, turn on your camera and ask your question out loud. Emily, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, you're on mute though. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, um, yeah no, I'm just, um, I, I know this might be better after a state presentation on this as well, but I'm really inspired by the principles in which um, your organization is working um, through. And um, I, I'm so sorry, I had to step away for a second. We had a construction thing at our house. So I missed a little bit toward the end, but I came back in while you were talking about not putting funding priorities first. So this is a long conversation or long question, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm working on the transportation um, kind of team talking about a transportation package. And like one of the things that we're talking about right now are priorities. And I just think that your priorities listed summarize that really well. And I just wanna tell you, I'm going to bring that forward. But then with that uh, funding side, I guess, that's been the big conversation for us is what's equitable funding? Like, how are we, you know, putting this money into these, 
these three priority areas and what, you know, because you can think about tolling, you can think about a gas tax, you can think about a road usage charge, but, you know, there's all these different ways to start funding these projects, but I'm really trying to understand what is the most equitable way to do that and also pushes us forward, right? Um, and so anyways, I just wanted to get your perspective on that. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been um, less concerned with with how things are funded and more with what are the outcomes we're going to accomplish, and that's a big shift that we've made in the last couple of years. Um, but there are there are a lot of like kind of ideas around there about which sources of funding are are less regressive or, or more progressive, um, and um, and then I think another sort of element of all this is um, is um, you know, this concept that we've had of the trust fund and the whole idea of the trust fund um, that's been in place since the beginning of the, you know, since the 50s, since the beginning of the of the uh, highway, federal highway program is that people pay in a gas tax, it's a user fee, and then it's this lockbox trust, trust, lock trust fund that's just used for transportation. And so you're kind of like getting what you pay for. And the reality is that over the past, um, really, uh, it's kind of been since I started working on these issues about 10 years ago. It's just the, the gas tax isn't paying for what we're, what we're getting anymore. It hasn't been increased since 1993. And um, it's just kind of a joke. It's like we, we have all these budget maneuvers. And in fact, in this bipartisan um, infrastructure proposal, there's some of, the, some of those same things. I remember um, back with map 21 there was this concept of pension smoothing there's just these artificial kinds of budget maneuvers that make it look like we're raising money we're really basically taking money from the general fund putting it in the in the highway trust fund and then paying for transportation that way so we need to let go of this concept of a user fee and the idea that because we're using user fee we're putting 80 percent of our funding to um, highways and, and only 20 percent to transit and just say you know what this isn't a user fee funded program anymore it's it's just a program and we can find different ways to fund it and we should be investing in transportation in a way that achieves our goals. And that's that's not an arbitrary 80-20 split of 80% for highways and 20% for transit. It's like, let's invest in our communities. Thank you. That is really insightful. I appreciate it. Um, I think this is actually a good transition um, to Alex. Um, so Representative Wicks serves on the State Transportation Committee uh, for the House. And so she's thinking through, you know, uh, uh, a potential funding, uh, pa a new pa transportation package that might come together before the next session. Um, and so I'll just put a flag out. Uh, Snowtrack doesn't take positions on specific bills because we don't lobby, but we will putting out a values and principles uh, statement in terms of transport state transportation funding. So happy to work with you on kind of uh, with Representative Wicks on what that, those values mean. Um, but with that, I'm gonna um, shift to Alex Hudson. Um, so if you could flip on here, Alex. Oh, you're there, perfect. I'm gonna spotlight you. All right. Um, so okay. I first really got to know Alex when, um, probably before, uh, on things like letting I-5 and uh, trying to build more bike parking on First Hill. Um, but uh, we got to speak to a community, I think it was a community council um, for passing SD3 and Alex was dynamite. Uh, this was before she became a the TCC executive director. And from that, uh, debate that we that was being held, um, I knew Alex was gonna be a tremendous uh, advocate for transit uh, in her new role with TCC. Uh, so you'll get to see some of her passion here and help, uh, I think she's gonna provide a picture of what's happening in Olympia, but also what's happening locally in our communities. So Alex, it's all yours. Great, thank you everyone. Yeah, hi, happy to be here. Alex Hudson uh, from Transportation Choices Coalition. I'm gonna talk about um, how we fund transportation here in Washington through the lens of how it's funded at the state level. Um, that is not the entirety of the picture of how transit and transportation is funded, but we're gonna kind of focus in there. So the first thing that you need to know about how we fund transit and transportation in Washington is that it's completely decentralized. Um, so we've got decentralized systems that are all interconnected. So we've got roads and rail and buses and airports and seaports. 
the transit, all of it coming together, all um, being managed multi-jurisdictionally. So every single level of government uh, has either a, a mode or a role across modes. So you'll see that transportation funding and jurisdiction is really a mate, an overlapping matrix of mode and jurisdiction. And that's state, tribal nations, counties and cities, ports, and public transit um, authorities. All of this is coordinated, but as you can imagine, with such complex systems, so many different kinds of government involved, um, it's not easy. So that is that is one of the challenges, but we have quite a few challenges actually in how transportation is funded here in Washington. The first one um, is that we do not have enough money. I had the honor of sitting on the Joint Transportation Committee Task Force where we did a needs assessment over uh, the summer of 2020. And it is um, absolutely clear across jurisdictions and across modes that we have less than half of what is needed in order to adequately maintain, preserve, and operate just what we have now. Um, so the we have unfunded plans and unfunded um, capital and preservation needs to the scale of, of having less than half of what we need. And because those are so large, it makes it actually really hard to kind of scale down projects so we can't find value efficiencies that are adequate to solving the gap there. And what that means then is we are oftentimes, as Chris referenced, there is a real tension between maintenance and preservation of our existing assets and facilities and the desire to build or expand new capital projects. And a lot of that is frankly quite political. Um, the results of that is that we have extremely high levels of deferred maintenance here in Washington State. We are rated overall for our infrastructure to be uh, operating at a C minus. And um, I know it's been a while since we've probably all been in school, but that's not a very good grade. Um, and as a result of that, costs are increased over time, right? You, the longer you ignore a problem, the more expensive it gets overall. So our, our facilities are in poor condition and we don't have the money to fix them. We also don't have oftentimes a coordinated plan of how we're gonna get that money. Um, and so, what that means is that jurisdictions um, uh, are oftentimes kind of spiraling. You all are experiencing this in your jobs every day of writing grants. Um, you get non-repeating sources of funding. On the transit side, they, there is a need to renew sources of funding on a regular basis. And so there isn't sort of longevity or predictability in um, even in the resources that we have right now. And as I said, Yes, we have less than half of what we need. And I think what's important to know, particularly in Snohomish County, is that doesn't even include our anchor investments. That's just what we have now. So Highway 2 Trestle, not included in that half number. Um, so we're not starting in a really great place. And the, the needs are enormous. So like, what are the needs? I'm gonna focus in on the transit side here, but um, certainly you can look in some of these reports and, and see it by other modes if you're interested. There, by, by jurisdiction, um, entities that are managing public transit alone, both in the program and capital side, which is the admin and operations, the maintenance, the improvements and the preservation, have an unmet need over 10 years of somewhere between 18 to $22 billion. So our agencies are uh, really facing pretty significant. And that is one of the highest by mode. Uh, and as a percentage is actually equivalent to the overall need that is in, in highways. And if you look at that by mode, so that's gonna include bus, rail, and all of the active transit um, together, we are missing somewhere between 27 to $33 billion um, in order to adequately, as I said, operate, maintain, uh, preserve, and improve our systems. And the overall impact of that is in the opinion of Transportation Choices Coalition and our clean and just transportation table, we are operating in a transportation funding system that is fundamentally broken. Um, the 32 agencies lack the ability 
to complete their plans or deliver service that their communities want, need, and deserve. Um, and that is also true on WashDOT's um, planning that, that they do around this issue. That means that agencies struggle to maintain service or to meet the needs, desires of, of the communities that they serve and are put into the position of making uncomfortable compromises about, um, about the distribution of, of those investments. And from a people perspective, what that means is that people have less good options. The options that they do have um, for transit commutes are more expensive, um, or if they don't have an option to take transit because of where they live and the land use patterns or the um, ability of their transit agency to meet their schedules. We know that in the state of Washington, for example, it costs the average person um, $10,000. This is a triple A estimated this $10,000 to own, insure, and maintain and operate a vehicle. And people are in the Seattle area in 2016, we're spending $438 per month on transportation costs. If you are operating, uh, if you are living at the federal poverty level, what that means for you is that you're spending 43% of your overall income on transportation. The federal government says that number should be closer to 15. People should be spending significantly less now than um, what they're asked to do because of this, these huge gaps. Um, that means that also people have longer trips. Um, their time, uh, that they could be spending either in you know, leisure or with their families is, is taken from them as they're doing um, this data, uh, doing this, these commutes, and they have insufficient access. So as you look at like bicycle lanes, sidewalks, curb cuts, vertical access, any of the elements about how we get people to transit systems, um, we, are, we are not doing what, it, what is needed there. Um, and that of course, all of these negative impacts, as we know, are uh, deeply disproportionate if we unpeel them and look at how they are affecting, um, in particular, um, uh, racial demographics and, and um, BIPOC populations in our communities. That, and that's not just an inconvenience. That means that communities are experiencing significantly less access to opportunity, like jobs and education, uh, this is contributing to um, cl global climate change. We are going to experience the most significant and uh, potentially deadly heat wave in the history of our region. And it is not lost on any of us, should not be lost on any of us. The transportation sector is the leading contributor to greenhouse gases anywhere in the state. In order to meet our state's climate goals, we need to significantly reduce vehicle miles traveled by 55%, that means over one out of every two miles that is driven right now needs to get onto another mode. And we need to electrify the remaining 95% of uh, those trips. And if we don't do that, we can all um, look forward to experiencing and living through uh, really significant impacts of the global climate crisis like we are what we doing this weekend. So. In total, that means that we have a transportation system that is insufficient to meet our needs. It is volatile. I'll talk more about this because of how what we're actually raising the money with. It is aggressive. It is overly um, burdening users and user fees. I talked about that affordability perspective, and it's inflexible. That's built into um, uh, some of some of what I'll talk about later. So, what are we doing with the money that we have right now? Uh, we spend money in transportation through transportation packages. Transportation packages are multi-billion dollar budgets over the length of several year over biennium budgets. And they raise new revenues, um, taxes, and they do investments, pay fors um, in, in combination. These are built by legislators through legislative process. We have a legislator here with us who's involved um, in, in that process. And as I, as I talked about earlier, and I'll go into more details here, this is a, a quite political process. Washington is one of only a few number of states that um, does not do performance-based investment meaning that the process of developing transportation packages is done by legislators with advisement from the agencies, but isn't need to be tracked back into showing that it is contributing to any of our stated goals or adopted goals around transportation, such as you know, safety, equity, 
um, maintenance and preservation um, or climate change. So TCC actually has a bill that we introduced called Transportation for All, which seeks to um, move our state more towards and align with really um, how other states conduct their business, which is uh, performance-based spending in our in our transportation system. I will I will link to that in a little bit. Um, we are overwhelmingly investing in highways. Uh, right now, we are operating under a system where 95% of transportation spending is spent on, um, on highways, or put, put, put differently, only 5% of all transportation spending goes towards multimodal, um, goes into the multimodal account. Uh, and what is in the multimodal account oftentimes isn't actually supporting um, multimodal needs. Uh, that, of course, also prioritizes capital projects as opposed to maintenance and preservation. That's part of it being baked into the, the way the business political process. We did have a wonderful um, addition in a couple of budgets back, which is a proviso for Washout to study this. And they've come up with some you know, really interesting ways that they're going to be able to maybe reform how we do that spending, which would be great. Um, and these sources are highly volatile. We, we primarily fund through the state's gas tax. The state's gas tax is by 18th Amendment, which was passed just in 1950, um, is a means that we can only spend gas tax revenues on highway purposes. And so the single biggest source of transportation revenue is restricted to um, a, a type of expenditure that doesn't meet the totality of our values or all our goals. Um, and so what are we going to do about that, right? And a lot of problems here to solve. So Transportation Choices Coalition is in our 28th year of fighting for more and better transportation options for people across Washington. And we have a, a, a statewide presence and have on the ground capacity working year round and particularly during legislative session to help um, you know, get to get to reform here. We are the facilitator of a clean and just transportation coalition, which includes um, communities of color based organizations, environmental organizations, labor, social justice, racial justice, identity populations all coming together to talk about how we're going to have a better transportation system. And we have um, a set of principles that guides our work, which really roots us in um, basically the getting to the opposite of what I talked about earlier, we want to have um, a transportation system that is progressive, right, that is not cost burdening people with the least ability to pay, that is sustainable, by which I mean both financially sustainable, as well as contributes towards environmental sustainability, that have, generates enough revenue to be sufficient to meet our needs, and that is flexible and adaptable so that we can be spending money on what we actually want, and not just be forced into spending money um, on, on things that don't uh, meet our goals. And so we have these guiding principles. And through that, we also have um, revenue principles and expenditure principles. Um, and we also have a list of the kinds of revenue that we're looking to generate. So I will also link that here um, as soon as I'm done talking. So what do we want from revenues? We want to move away from sales and gas tax. Um, we want to move away from restricted sources like the 18th um, Amendment and gas taxes. But while we are in that system, we want to do better with what we have. So we want to not pay for things that could be funded by gas tax in our multimodal account, most um, significantly the ferry system, which is indeed part of the state highway system, should be funded through gas tax in the opinion of TCC and our coalition. We want to make sure that we're spending more on maintenance and preservation, and we want to make sure that the money that we're spending is tracked back into performance towards our, towards our state's adopted goals. We want to move away from flat user fees. So as we do, um, you know, there's an important conversation about user fees, fares, and um, tolls, and all of that to be had. Um, and certainly, important components of building a sustainable and adequate budget, but flat fees, right, are super regressive. So TCC has been working on low-income fare studies for ferry fares, and at the local level here, um, 
around transit as well. We wanna create a system that doesn't perpetuate inequity. So we wanna make sure that rural communities, tribal communities, BIPOC communities are not experiencing overwhelming um, either burdens or harm um, in the form of penalties um, or you know, the less options, more time spent, more money spent on transportation. We wanna make sure that we're taxing what we don't want. A huge round of applause to the state legislature for the passage of extremely significant and nation leading landmark legislation around taxing pollution um, in our transportation and moving that investment into our transportation sector. That's a great start. Um, and we want all of this to support workers. It's really important, right, that we have a just transition in our economy because we know that investing in operations and maintenance of transit systems is a huge bang for our buck, not just in terms of the return on the dollar, one dollar spent, four dollars return, but also long range sustainable good jobs that families can count on. Um, and what do we want to spend all this money on? We want to spend all this uh, money on things that uh, promote structural equity, right? We, we want to um, give people their time and, and their money back and increase their safety and their exposure to, to greenhouse gases and other air pollutions. We also want for the agencies themselves to be orienting more towards uh, structural equity with the um, inclusions of racial equity toolkits and advisory panels to help guide this work so that we get the most upstream possible so that from um, the frameworks and the criteria flow good projects every time as opposed to having to kind of straight laid out every everything. We want to reduce DMT. As I said, we have to do that. We need to be investing in solutions, transit, walking, biking, and other things that are going to get us to reducing DMT. There's a huge land use component to that as well. Um, we wanna transition to a clean transportation system. We wanna make sure that we are electrifying um, every aspect of our transportation system in a, in a just way, uh, and in particular, our transit agencies. Um, and we wanna have modern and safe assets. We do not want to live in a C minus world. Washingtonians deserve better than that. And we want to make sure that we're doing expenditures that um, give people um, more dignity in, in, in their infrastructure and allows us to be the kind of world-class state um, that we really aspire to be. Next up, right, there's uh, potentially going to be a special session uh, in the fall where the transportation, uh, where we'll come back together to talk about passing a transportation package. A lot of uh, proposals were put forward last year, we're right in the middle of building a new transportation package. And we saw certainly, you know, the Miles Ahead um, program doing that came out of the house, significantly increasing the percentage of um, spending that goes into transit, it's 500% increase. Um, it, not so great on the on the forward Washington side, the Senate side, we think ha, can do more to meet the, the aspirations that we have around having a transportation system that uh, is funded in a progressive, sustainable, sufficient and flexible way so that the outcome is, is that people can travel and get where they need to go with abundant choices that are um, safe and affordable and sustainable. So I'll stop there. I'm going to drop some links in, but I, if, if folks have questions, I want to respect their time. And we have about five minutes left. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, as I think everybody will recognize from both Alex and Chris, they're a wealth of information and knowledge and um, really involved both in Olympia and regionally and, uh, and nationally. Um, so if you ever have questions, I hope you, like uh, the audience members, you go to their organizations as a resource uh, to, to do that. And so first question, Alex and Chris, what's the best way for people uh, in their different roles to be able to get involved uh, in the work that you do? Um, I'm just dropping my <laughs> email in the chat right there because that's one way to just get in touch. Um, yeah, we have a, a few different ways. We have a, a grassroots list, so you can go on our website and um, sign up and get updates from us and be able to, to weigh in when there's the right moments to call your member of Congress about, about uh, what's, what's moving. Um, if you're part of an agency or an organization, we have a membership program and you can be a part of that. Um, and get much more detailed info about what's happening and help us to shape uh, how we're working on federal policy so that we make sure that it 
the way that it works is going to hit the ground correctly and do what we want it to do in, in all of our communities. Um, so that's another way to get more deeply involved. Um, yeah, just track what we do and, um, and there's opportunities to both weigh in on how we do this and to weigh in with your members of Congress. Yeah, I would similarly, right, uh, TCC is um, just dropping my email right in there, as well as a bunch of links that talk more detail about what I went over today. Um, get in touch. Do you th 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 that second C in, is coalition, right? So we want people to come aboard with us and be part of this. A really great way that you can do that is by participating in our, we call it the WADA call, the Washington Transportation Advocates call, which is every Friday. Um, we invite people from agencies, jurisdiction, like just all of our advocates um, come together every other Friday in the summer and, and most Fridays and other times to, to share information across jurisdictions and modes, to talk about um, different levels of government and, um, and to strategize about what we're gonna do. We also send out notes about that, that um, are extremely detailed. Our program and policy director, Hester Sarabrand, does an amazing job of putting it all together and we can sign you up for that list. You can also sign up to receive updates from Transportation Choices Coalition and certainly as a nonprofit organization, your support is always welcome. Um, but we, we want to be working together with folks about um, and building all of this because it is going to take a really loud voice of people coming together and saying our transportation funding system is broken. So what the, the things that it is producing is not adequate to our actual needs and we need reform that is going to better orient us towards the values and the shared goals and outcomes that we have. So that's only possible if we do that together. So I would say come aboard. You're muted, Brock. We have about a minute left. And uh, so I wanna make sure if somebody has a burning question that they're able to ask it um, besides myself. So again, feel free to- This is Alex. This. Oh yeah, hi, Alex. Hi, uh, not a burning question. I just wanted to make sure, where would I be able to sign up to join that Friday call? Is that in the chat? If you send me an email, I've dropped my email in there, I'll get you all linked up. Okay, fantastic. Thank Same you. Same goes for everybody. You don't have to be an Alex to participate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, Thanks, Alex. <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic um, meeting and call to coordinate the, this work across the entire state. Um, I, I wish it was instituted long before uh, Alex Hudson joined TCC and Hester joined TCC. Well, I, uh, I'm wearing my fund public transit t-shirt. I don't know if you've had it. Um, so Alex Hudson, TCC have been, uh, for a number of years, been hosting Ride Transit Month. And this year, in uh, Ride Transit Month being June, and we're obviously about over with June, but you can still buy your t-shirt, I am sure, online on TCC's website or linking to their shop. Um, I just put the link in the link in the chat. <laughs> yep. Say it with a shirt. <laughs> and it's a good way to, to promote the message of funding public transit. Um, with that, it, it's been a pleasure, Alex and Chris, and I look forward to continuing to work with you into the future. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for spending your sunny Friday just talking about transportation funding. Absolutely. <laughs> Stay cool, everybody. <laughs> Take care.